So now that we've had the chance to play this a little bit, obviously we are ESPN Esports, so we're going to look at this under the Esports lens, right? We don't have any information on when an official league might happen, what that league might look like, but let me ask this question. Jacob, let's start with you. After playing this game for a while, do you believe that Valorant will succeed as an Esport after initial impressions? Yes. I think that it has a very good potential to succeed. For a number of different reasons. So one, I just think it's a pretty good game overall, based off of what I've played in beta. Um, I think it's fun. I think that there is a high level of mastery in it, meaning that you can have fun, like Emily said, at the lowest of levels and feel good against your friends. But then ultimately you play against like a professional Counter-Strike player in this instance and you're actually ass at the game. Um, And that is what makes Call of Duty fun for the same reason, right? It's something COD does well is that like, oh yeah, you're the best in your friend group until you play against a pro and then you get wrecked. Um, And and so there's like a, there's definitely a wide breadth of being able to enjoy it while also being competitive. And I think that if we take League of Legends, for example, that uh, is a game that also does that quite well is like, you there's a it, it fuels competitive drive that a lot of people in life have and i think that the valorant will do the same um and if they come out with a good ladder system for ranked matches um that is similar to what league has i think in some instances um i think that it will be great for a lot of people because uh it will feel that driving you will you will feel that you are improving and you will enjoy that nice dopamine releasing your brain that you're getting good at something um yes. So, yes, and that's part of the esports component because that's how people scale up and eventually join the competitive scene, particularly new players who are not Counter-Strike pros uh, that will be probably porting over in some instances. Um, The next part of this is that uh, I think Riot, from a game balance perspective, has done a really great job over the years um, with League of Legends being able to keep it fresh, even though the game is, is... 11 years old at this point, or it came out in beta in 2009, so 11 years ago. Um, League is is constantly changing and evolving, although at the core it is still more or less the same. You're destroying the Nexus, you're taking down towers and inhibitors along the way. Um, and But they're changing things that keep it interesting for people. Um, if they continue to do that with Valorant and they keep it fun, um, they I think they'll ride the wave in a way that like we've seen games like Apex Legends, as much as I love it, they had this huge big spike in popularity. They paid Ninja a million dollars to be involved and all the stuff that you see in Valorant right now. And then... Uh, do we know, here, uh, just to interject there, do we know if Riot Games has paid any influencers? They have no, they have not. Zero. No, yeah. paid. no, no. This, what is a difference, all, this is all organic. So th- what a difference that is. Compare the Apex Legends launch to the to what we're seeing with Valorant right now. That That's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think, you know, like we saw a lot of... We saw a lot of uh, hype around Fortnite organically at the beginning, but at some point, though, some of those celebrities that we saw up here on streams and things like that, those people got paid uh, by maybe not Epic, but other parties that had interest in them being there. Um, you can take what I'm saying and allude to and, and make your assumptions uh, as you may. Um, but I uh, I believe that uh, this is particularly interesting because this is oh, very organic. Um because and and like Ninja responded to me in in a, tw- in a tweet thread I had about this, where I, he basically said that like Riot's credibility uh, made him want to be a part of this, right, and want to be a part of the beta because Riot, you know, every every professional gamer in the world knows about League of Legends, even a little bit, right? Like I go to events of games I have never covered in my damn life. Right. Like I love Rocket League and watch it from afar. I went to my first Rocket League event for last year, last summer. Mm-hmm. And some of the players knew me because what do I cover? League of Legends. Right. right? And because they they want to pay attention. They want to understand the business and the salary because it helps them negotiate when their game grows. So everyone, every professional gamer knows League. And so I think that's why they were able to get so many people in the door here is because League of Legends has such a high credibility. Um and, and so, yeah, so back to my original point, I think the game balance will be really important. The next part of that is my biggest question for Riot as an eSport around Valorant is they they have the ability to right now, if they said, all right, guys, $40 million Valorant franchise, they would have people out the door. Yeah. Even in the middle of a pandemic where people don't want to yeah. invest money right now, they would still have people out the door, right? Um, because everyone wants to be associated with Riot Games. They struck lightning with League of Legends. Everybody believes it's the next eSport, and this thing is blowing up um, in a way that Overwatch and Call of Duty are not, which are demanding similar 
amounts of money, right? Um, the but what makes League of Legends so great is that it was built from the ground up when Riot was a small little startup in uh, in like student housing uh, in, ca- in Southern California, and then slowly built its way up to being an esport. Right? It didn't have its first major like international championship until until 2011, two years after the beta of the game. You know, and it scaled. And by the time the big money came in in 2015 and 2016, it was scaling organically. The community had built itself up. So Riot has a decision to make here, right? I think the best o- option for them is to support the amateur tournaments, to support third-party organizers, to partner with the Dream Hacks and the ESLs and the other people that want to run these things and really become a part of the community. Um, and support those, and then eventually move to some sort of big business money making model. Um, but I do think that overall, like they need to choose wisely here. And I don't think they've ever been faced with a choice like this because Lee Lee came organically out of them being forced to be that way, not because they had a choice. Emily, um, I think my big thing is that uh, I th- this will kind of dovetail into some of Jacob's points, but when it, we've talked about this on other uh, videos that we've done around Valorant, um, and my big thing is how are they going to break into China and then to a lesser extent, South Korea? Mm. Um, those are the two markets that I'm looking at as really, really important for this game to, if you want to elevate it to something even comparable to League of Legends, like worldwide status, I think you have to look at what made those games successful Mm -hmm. in those regions, how they're reaching out to those regions. And I think you already see it, right? Like already we have a Chinese character, we have South Korean character. Um, and then additionally, I think, uh, Hey chat, should we have a Turkish character in this game? What do you think? Should Valorant have a Turkish agent? What do you probably think will be. Will I mean, I mean, what, yeah. what, I mean what, what do you think our Turkish dominated chat uh, chat will say to that question? <laughs> Anyways, anyway, um, I, I think the the big thing is that I want to see how they break into Chinese the Chinese market because part of the reason why League of Legends is so successful is because Tencent this is and this is before they were a major investment partner in Riot. Uh, this is before they had that kind of investment switch over where they have the majority stake in Riot. They were just invested in Riot, uh, like to a lesser extent. But they were the distributor for League of Legends in China, and it was basically hooked to everyone's QQ account, which gave it like really, really easy advertising for a free to play game. Um, and that w- it was like an instant success, right? Like China was on mm, the streaming thing well before uh, the US was in terms of just how we look at streaming and how we think of it as something that, you know, you just go home and stream now and it's a normal thing. Like China was was about, I would say, maybe five years ahead of us on that due to some of the restrictions around their actual like national television broadcasting. And I won't get into it like a, a super large amount. You can always hit me up on Twitter if you want me to ramble about video games in China. But um, I think that is a major thing that I'm looking at, right, is how are they going to hit that market Um, And how are they going to hit it in a way that is, to Jacob's point, organic? And also the esports landscape in and of itself has changed significantly from the time of League of Legends, where it kind of just grew. And then we started seeing circuit uh, stuff with like DreamHack, MLG, uh, yes, like, uh, you know, the IEMs. um, And... We only saw LCS, and this was like not franchised. We only saw LCS and LPL as the major leagues uh, in 2013. And in South Korea, on GameNet, uh, OGN, who had already run like StarCraft tournaments up until then, was already running the uh, League of Legends tournaments in South Korea. So that was like very, not fractured, but like everyone was kind of doing different things as it grew up. Um, now that there is this expectation from esports community, whenever you release a game, it's like, how is it going to be an esport? What's your entry plan going to be? How soon are we going to start competition? Is this going to be franchise? Like those are already things that people are asking about this game that is in a closed beta right now. Um, so I think those, those questions are far off down the road. 
But the most interesting thing to me is going to be a how do they enter into China, the Chinese market, especially since it's sounding like the there's going to be a slight delay there. Um, and then also, how are they going to mitigate the fact that you're going to have a ra- like a, a large amount of people being like, OK, so when is this going to be an esport? What are you guys doing for it? Um, and and that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Right. Like we don't have to have a top down franchise system right off the bat. And I'd actually argue that that hurt Overwatch League a bit because the game itself wasn't allowed to get a really strong foothold in China. It wasn't allowed to get a really strong foothold in South Korea before um, the the league itself started. Uh, I I believe yet less than a year after the game was released, the the franchise league started. Jacob can probably correct me on that. Um, So I think they have to find a balance, right? And the, the biggest difference is that the landscape in and of itself, like the way people look at investment, the way people look at esports, especially now on top of this, with a global pandemic going on, even like within our own company, we're being looked at a lot more closely because a lot of traditional sports around the world are not happening. So it's a really weird time uh, and a really interesting time, like from an outsider perspective, to be looking at how Riot is going to handle this game. Tyler? Uh, so I actually talked to the developers, I mean, about this and they basically have, they said this to me and they said this to Dr. Lupo and then the two, uh, kind of public interviews they've done with Ziegler and, uh, super cakes is that, that, yeah, they are for the year one, it's going to be a lot of community driven stuff. It's going to be a lot of grassroots tournaments. It's going to be those invitationals from probably those third party tournament organizers to kind of build up you know the players that you know are going to be the stars of this game because well i do think a few of the players right now who are streaming and who have the hype around them the the xcs go pros and you know the asus and the dizzies of the world who are just mechanically gifted they have they're gonna probably i think survive you know kind of the beta rush and kind of kind of establish themselves as pros but i think a lot of the players the best players in the world i'm pretty sure the best you know valorant player who's ever who's ever going to who's going to be the faker of this game or you know the top level simple or something like that he's probably like a 14 year old in china right now he probably doesn't even know Bowen exists that's the <laughs> or thing he's right playing league of legends or they're playing league of legends right now or like i'm like i i've seen this in so many games where like it's oh man beta comes out oh man this guy's the best this guy's the best this guy's the best they're going to be the best players in the world they're going to be the best players in the world and then right when it – as it grows, you get to see this like, organic talent just bust through the scenes because competition breeds excellence. And when you have a competitive scene and you let it grow, you get your fakers. You get your you know rookies. You get your simples who kind of grow with the game itself, and they – they, you know, bring in a new kind of different feel to it than, you know, players transitioning from other games. And so, yeah, I, I believe Riot's plan is for the first year to, to most likely – have grass, you know, probably hold their own invitationals, probably have like an OGN thing, hopefully. I'm sure they're going to go big in China. They already had a so, Twitch Rivals event, for example. Yeah, like they're going to host a lot of tournaments and they're going to let a lot of third parties host their tournaments to kind of build up hype, right? Sure. Like they want the hype to continue and they want as many tournaments going on as possible so everyone can grow their own organic scenes around the world because they want this to be a global game. They don't just want to be like, because I agree with Jacob, if they were like, hey, uh, we're going to have a uh, U.S. based after the global pandemic's over. Hopefully, let's say start of 2021, we're going to have a 20 team global league in Los Angeles, and every team in the world, every just give us your applications, 40 million buy-in. They could probably get 20 franchises pretty easily, and probably decline a hundred of them. Like they would have their teams for this, you know, global Valorant league. Sure. But then. Then what happens? Like the what about fans in China or fans in Korea? They want to see these players in front of them growing naturally. That's what happened with Faker in Mad Life because they saw those players grow in front of them and become stars in Korea. Same with China. Same in Turkey. Same in Brazil. I think that for Valorant because they they are preaching that they want this to be a global game, the most global game of all time, competitive wise that I think they want to run tournaments everywhere and have these scenes organically grow up from these, you know, homegrown stars.